Hello, BookTube. Micah Cummins and I are doing a buddy read. We are going to keep doing buddy reads. It's a lot of fun to do. It's one of those little endemic aspects of BookTube. And a buddy read can be in both directions, right? It can be something that you do on Voxer or via email. Maybe even private videos that, but that you don't share with the rest of the world. It's just one of these private, personal connections that BookTube actually facilitates in a wonderful way. I benefited from that greatly. But BookTube is also, as we've mentioned, partly performance. You are, you are turning on a camera. Even if your performance is as, let's say, low-tech as mine, you're still talking to people who aren't really there. Uh, hence my imaginary booktube friends. And Mike and I decided right away that we wanted our booktube, our buddy, this buddy read of ours to be public facing. Plenty of people don't make that decision. That's just fine. We decided, you know, to announce it, make videos about it, and welcome you to join in. And we chose for uh, the month of April, Beowulf. Uh, but Beowulf is just a bit over 3,000 lines of verse, uh, which is not that hard to read. That's a, it's not a long book. Uh, so we decided to do uh, multiple translations of Beowulf so that April becomes not only reading and rereading Beowulf, which is a real good way to possess a work, in fact the only way to really possess a work, is to read it over and over again. And Beowulf certainly deserves that. Terrific, terrific book. Rollicking, one might even say. Uh, but also to perforce study translation. Beowulf was written in Old English. It, you could be as proficient in English as you want. If you stare at a manuscript of it, you could stare at it until you're old and gray, and you wouldn't understand a word of it. <laughs> it's, it's an alien language. So it needs a translator. I, and I stress that because, for instance, Chaucer, who's, you know, 500 years later in English, does not require a translator. If you stare at Chaucer long enough, if, let's say, you type it out instead of the, the ornate, you know, lettering, if you stare at Chaucer long enough, you will be able to read him without a translator, without anyone modernizing his work. Uh, Beowulf, not so much, which means you're in the hands of a translator. So we decided that for April, we would read a bunch of different translations of Beowulf. We started with Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's translation of Beowulf. Then we moved on to uh, the Penguin Classic. Michael Alexander does, did a popular translation for Penguin Classic, and that was... Tolkien's wasn't done for publication. He never worked it up into a finished into a finished work. Whereas the Michael Alexander thing was uh, a bank holiday for its author because he he very much did do it for publication. And when once Penguin had it, it went into every school in the UK, it went into every school in the United States. It was the Penguins are often disseminated to schools, uh, but translations of Beowulf still continue. Translations of Beowulf are are, are our cottage industry. There have been tons and tons and tons. This is one of the most translated books in the world. Uh, and in the 20th century, especially towards the middle of the 20th century, especially after the war, there arose again the idea of a popular translation of a classic of some kind, where the author is not angling for a contract with Penguin Books or Dover reprints or whatever where they want to bring the book to the market as a, a book on its own, as a popular work. And if it gets taken up by schools, so much the better. But that's not necessarily any part of the motivation. And uh, that brings us to this book, which is by the translators Burton Raffle. And this came out, uh, my timing right? Uh, yeah, 1963. This came out in 1963 and was enormously popular in schools anywhere even though I don't think that was ever its, uh, its ultimate goal. Mentor was a really good paperback line. The, their books were inexpensive. This thing was $1.95, but you could find Mentor versions of Beowulf with this exact same cover were, that were even less than that. Uh, and it did get taken up by schools because this is a very complete, conscientious introductory module to Beowulf. It's the whole of the poem translated by a really good translator. But there's a really good introduction and there are lots and lots of notes that not only explain weird or cryptic passages in the original, but also uh, theorize. Burton Raffle is very much present in this translation, not just in terms of the choices that he makes, but in terms of his own commentary on the thing. Very. And uh, I found this paperback copy. When did I find you? Uh, 
2021. I hadn't had it in years and years. I once used to recommend the daylights out of this thing to people just say, all right, well, this is, this is as close as you're going to get to the original. Plus, it gives you, the book gives you all of the surrounding cultural and historical material that you need to understand this thing. I would argue that, that uh, that's just icing on the cake. My, my argument with any really good translation is that you probably don't need that. Uh, you're going to be thrilled by the story of Beowulf, and your heart's going to be broken at the end, regardless of whether or not you know any of that social or historical stuff. So this has a lot of it, if you want it. But ultimately, it's going to come down to a question of translation. And every translator has to comment on that. Uh, we saw Michael Alexander comment on it, and uh, Burton Raffle comments on it too. I want to, uh, to read his, uh, his rationale just a bit. He quotes himself. <laughs> I believe it's himself that he's quoting. He quotes a, an earlier uh, credo on translation, the first part of which I want to read to you. The translator's only hope is to recreate something roughly equivalent in the new language, something that is itself good poetry and that at the same time carries a reasonable measure of the force and flavor of the original. So a combination of what we talked about last time, strictly adhering to word for word or conveying the essence. Uh, but then he goes on in the, in the preface to this, to this edition of Beowulf. My practice, however, varied somewhat in that particularly in the matter of alliteration, Beowulf is a poem of 3,182 lines. Techniques adequate to a, group, uh, to a group of shorter works will not necessarily serve it equally well. I have felt it advisable, even obligatory, to alliterate much more freely, occasionally as the Old English alliterates, more usually in irregular patterns developed ad hoc. As we mentioned last time, the Old English very much regularly alliterates. Da, 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 that won't, if Michael Alexander tries to re recapitulate that in English, it doesn't work. It's not how normal English works, even in verse. Uh, so here, Burton Raffle is announcing that he is going to play a little loose with that in order to convey the spirit of the poem while still giving you a sense that it's, this does have regular alliteration going on. These patterns include everything from alliteration on the first and fourth stresses to alliteration that runs through and across several lines. I've also used part alliteration. I've sometimes used paired alliteration, two words in a line alliterating according to one sound and two alliterating according to a wholly different sound. I have, even though infrequently, and I hope most discreetly, used a bit of internal rhyme. I should perhaps add that I have tried to let the weight and motion of each line determine where the stresses, four to a line, fall. The same word, therefore, need not be uh, an alliterating word each time it occurs. Uh, and we can read an example of how that, we can start off the book that way, with the beginning of Beowulf, which is interesting in its own right in terms of comparing translations, because like a few other epics that I could name, Beowulf starts with a single exclamation. It's not, it's not Virgil. It's not arms and the man I sing. It's, it's a boom, like that, to start with. Whether it's a single word, as perhaps you might find in, in ancient Greek epics, or not. In this case, the word that starts off Beowulf is a good index, in a, believe it or not, a single word, a single syllable word, is a good index of what kind of a translator you're going to get. Because the word is essentially the poet calling for everyone's attention. That's what it is. It's not part of the poem. It's, it's, it's the poet calling for everyone's attention in an oral recitation of the work. So how are you going to translate that? If you are uh, an antiquarian and you want to preserve an antiquarian thee and thou dost and dost <laughs> type flavor, you might say lo. Lo is not used anymore <laughs> in English at all. Uh, but you might say that because that's how it was meant when it was. If you want to say modernize your Beowulf, if you want to modernize it so that Bar Grendel's mother is a proto-feminist, then you might start off with something slangy like yo. In modern parlance, yo is essentially that. It is essentially a call to attention. It's essentially, hey, listen to me. So it's interesting to watch what each poet does with that, what they draw on, what, what, they're, what effect they're going for. Because unlike other translation uh, decisions that you might make in the course of this poem, 
this one's right away. It's, it's the immediate first thing that you see. Uh, Burton Raffle says, hear me. So he's, he's chosen very directly, not literally, but very directly to translate what the purpose of that word is, but he loses something because he has two words instead of only one, right? The, the thing that begins Beowulf is one barked word, <laughs> one barked command. So if you're looking at this from 1963, you could say, well, could you fix that? Assuming that you agree that there's something wrong with it, because it's two words instead of one, could you fix it? And yes, you could. It could be simply here, with an exclamation point. That would work just as well here, but maybe not for his rhythm. Let's read a, uh, just a bit of the beginning here, so we get a sense of what Burton Raffle is doing. It's different from what Michael Alexander does, very much so, and it's different from Tolkien as well. Hear me. We've heard of Danish heroes, ancient kings, the glory they cut, for themselves swinging mighty swords. How S.H.I.E.L.D. made slaves of soldiers from every land, crowds of captives he'd beaten, into terror he'd traveled to Denmark alone, an abandoned child, but changed his fate, lived to be rich and much honored. You see see what Raffle mentioned that he's doing? We have uh, swinging mighty swords. We have uh, uh, how S.H.I.E.L.D. made slaves of soldiers from every country. Uh, from every, from every, and then we have a line break to land with a comma. That's very good because it's flowing you forward. The poem does not do that, but English poetry does do that, and and that's good. That means that you get right away the sense that this particular translator is willing to give you English poetry <laughs> instead of just saying tough. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna translate this exactly as it was. Uh, but we have crowds of captives. We have terror traveled. We have. Uh, uh, rich and much, uh, would take them his soldiers, sailed, returned with tribute and obedience. They were a brave, uh, there was a brave king, uh, and he gave them more and more than his glory, conceived a son for the Danes, a new leader, allowed them by the grace of God. Had, they had lived before his coming, kingless and miserable, now the Lord of all life, ruler of glory, blessed them with a prince. That, uh, you know, you could make a game, and God knows a whole generation of students, English undergraduates, did make a game of trying to parse out exactly what Raffle is doing, rhyme scheme-wise, scansion-wise, in those lines. But if you take a step back from those, those uh, kinds of exercises, one thing you realize is that is really good. It's really gripping on its own. As English, it's really gripping. It's a really grippingly done thing, and it goes on throughout. Burton Raffles edition of the poem. Now at the end, you get uh, a glossary, you get uh, family trees, uh, and you get lots and lots of notes at the back. But the point, the whole point, the most important point of this, the thing that I think means, or is the reason for its popularity for so long, is that it's terrific to read. It, it does a good job, of con a better job, I would argue, than Tolkien or Michael Alexander of conveying the dramatic power of this poem. The what happened next power of this poem. I think it, it, can, it does a fantastic job of conveying that. I was worried that, uh, that it was going to feel a little creaky or dated because it's been a while since I read it, but it does not at all. <laughs> it feels absolutely, it was delightful. It's very meaty. It's a very... Uh, it's, it's a very academic, English major, class-friendly version of the book. I think probably in the back of his mind, Burton Raffle might have been hoping that this would be used in schools. If so, he got his wish a million times over. Uh, but when as we're going along with this month of Beowulf, this is my favorite so far, which I kind of wasn't expecting. I was kind of thinking that, that uh, especially since I'm doing a slow read-through of Lord of the Rings, I was kind of expecting that I would like Tolkien more. And I'm wondering, I think there are a few of you out there who are doing this along with me and Micah, we, where you are reading all these different translations. Uh, I'm wondering what you think. If you're getting to this one, what did you make of it? Uh, did you enjoy it more than the Penguin version, for instance? Uh, but that's, that's our Beowulf for today. 
And next week, we're moving on to a Beowulf translation that sold even more than the Burton Raffle translation. Uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, and we will see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Book Coop.